and welcome everyone to another installment of Retro J Games. Uh, this is our fourth installment, and today I'm actually going to talk about a, uh, something really cool, kind of retro to me from uh, from the 80s. But um, as you guys have seen on my previous uh, videos, um, two videos ago, I talked about the Atari 130EX, and um, that's basically the last interpretation of this one here, the Atari 800. Uh, now, the reason I'm bringing this one out is because I got something that um, is kind of reflective of me growing up around computers. But before that, I'm going to go through a couple of announcements. Uh, as everybody knows, the uh, Xbox uh, Series X and the Xbox Series X, the X and the S, both came out on November uh, 10th. And subsequently, the PS5 uh, was released on... The 12th. Uh, now there's been a lot of uh, information out there about these. Uh, the PS5 has had some issues, but basically they're all software related so far. But unfortunately, some of the issues with it will break your PS5. And basically it's anywhere between uh, connecting to your PS4 and transferring your files using an external hard drive from your PS4 to your PS5. Uh, there's another issue that if you're playing uh, Spider-Man, um, uh, the new one that came out, uh, the, uh, the Miles Morales version, uh, if you set your PS5 to sleep mode while playing that game, uh, it won't turn back on. Uh, so basically what's uh, what they're telling people right now is like if you're play, playing Spider-Man, uh, Miles Morales, uh, just shut off your uh, PS5 straight up. Don't set it on on uh, sleep mode, just turn it off completely. Uh, and the other issue is if you're looking to transferring your files from your PS4 to your PS5, wait until the next update comes up so that Sony can address those issues and you're not gonna end up breaking your PS5 and then having to send that in to get a replacement send in, uh, which can be kind of time consuming. Um, now with the Xbox Series X, the problem seems to go a little deeper than that. It's more hardware related. The main issue that a lot of people are uh, reporting out there is that uh, it makes a clicking noise. And some of them, on top of making the clicking noise, uh, it does um, it has, an, it has an issue basically accepting the disk. So whenever you try to put in the disk, it won't. And some people have tried forcing it and it's like the clicking issue happens. Now, Microsoft has addressed this saying, well, some of the issues might be related to the drive, but some of the issues, especially the ones that hear that clicking noise, and it does accept the disk, it might be a cable hitting the fan, uh, which is very poor quality check from Microsoft console manufacturers because that's something they should catch right before it, it, it gets packaged. It should not be even pass inspection. So there are some issues out there with these two consoles. Uh, overall, the uh, the reviews that are coming in from the people who are uh, having a good experience with them are pretty positive. They, they work great. Um, and the other issue with the disk-less uh, version of the uh, Xbox series, which is the S, uh, some apps are kind of acting up. Uh, primarily the Peacock TV, that's NBC's streaming service. Uh, for some reason, the app is not being able to take advantage of the bandwidth provided by the internet service provider. And uh, the video basically is coming out very low quality, very pixelated, and Microsoft is addressing the issue, trying to get its engineers to work on this problem. Uh, because it's not the Peacock app so much that's at fault, it's more, it seems like um, and there's an issue with Microsoft with that app specifically and they're trying to fix it. So hopefully it'll be up and running so people can actually see uh, their Peacock programming at high definition. So that's it for console releases. Now my next, um, I have uh, two announcements. One's actually, uh, I talked about this on the very first uh, episode and, uh, and then I talked about it on the second one. Uh, right away, the, uh, two weeks after, uh, ALA had announced that they were going to be doing uh, ALA in December and had started pre-selling tickets. 
uh, they ended up postponing it until 2021. Now, the new announcement is that ALA, for those of who don't know, Anime Los Angeles, is actually being postponed and pushed back to 2022. And part of the pushback is going to be that now uh, Anime Los Angeles is coming back to LA County. I know, sounds weird. Uh, Anime Los Angeles used to be held uh, by LAX. I believe it was either the Hilton or, or the Marriott. I always got, because there, there were events happening on both uh, at times, uh, PM, Pacific Media Expo would happen on one. And so I, I think it was the Hilton uh, where it would take place. And uh, it ended up moving a few years ago over to Ontario in San Bernardino County. So it was still called Anime Los Angeles, even though even though it was not taking place in Los Angeles anymore. <laughs> so it moved out there. For me, it always seemed a little too inconvenient because it is a bit of a drive. It's way out there and there's really nothing to do in the surrounding area of the Ontario Convention Center. Uh, for those of you who have been in that area, it's uh, the closest thing. If, if you want any kind of entertainment, you'd have to go to the Ontario Mills Mall, which is a bit of a drive from there. And in the immediate area, there's really very limited locations for you to go eat. So it's, I'm kind of looking forward to it moving to Long Beach. That's where it's going to be taking place in 2022 at the uh, Long Beach uh, Exhibition Center. Uh, the Exhibit Center, yeah, Long Beach Exhibit Center, which is where other uh, anime events have taken place in the past, like uh, an anime uh, Long Beach Comic Expo. Uh, used to be called Long Beach Comic Con. Every six months they had an event. It would be called Comic Con for one, and then six months later it would be called Long Beach Comic Expo. They definitely changed the name for both events to Long Beach Comic Expo from now on. But I always enjoy going to those uh, Long Beach Exhibit Hall <laughs> It's actually a very nice venue for events. I really like it. It's easily accessible. If you, if you don't want to drive, you can take the metro uh, system from here, the rail system here provided in LA. You can take it all the way over there and you're just a couple of blocks away and just walk down the hill and you're there. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, hopefully everything will be back up in, in running order by the time this event takes place at Long Beach um, uh, Exhibit Hall. Now this next bit of news is bad because it involves one of my favorite locations to go buy retro, uh, retro games, retro games, uh, where I like going to buy retro games and consoles, um, especially imports directly from Japan, and that's Retro Game Camp down in Little Tokyo. It's closed until further notice. Uh, they got looted really bad during the uh, protests this summer. And after that, they just never seem to be able to recover. They haven't gotten looted so badly during the, the riots and the, uh, that, that whole ordeal. Uh, they just haven't been able to recover. The other businesses around the area are fine. Uh, I'm very surprised those places didn't get break, broken into. Uh, but Retro Game Camp being electronics, I can see why that would have been the target for a lot of looters to break into and just take pretty much a decimated the place. Now I'm going to talk about some finds of mine from this week and these I actually found online. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, Facebook has a marketplace where you can go and look for local deals, but you're going to also look for some people can post there and they're willing to ship and they have the buy it, buy it now um, thing at the, at the bottom a little button you can click. And I was able to find these right here. This is a uh, Game Boy Color game. This is uh, Shrek. Uh, it's a uh, fairy tale breakdown. And it's a fighting game, actually. <laughs> it's, it's funny because um, uh, for a Shrek game, I would have thought it'd be a little different. Um, kind of like the ones for, for the consoles that are racing games. Those are fun. But this one, uh, I played with it a little bit and it's... It's okay. Uh, Centipede for the Game Boy. Uh, for those of you who uh, know Atari games, you know Centipede, Pac-Man, and of course I got another classic Tetris. I got all these four from the same uh, seller, and I got all four for ten dollars. Uh, once I got them, I opened them up to confirm they're actual, legitimate games and not knockoffs, and they're real. They're they're actual um, Game Boy games. So. I was very, very pleased about that, and I got a really good deal, $10 for all four. 
Another thing I want to talk about, the last installment, I, I talk about my figure collection. And I did mention uh, briefly bootlegs. And I want to show you guys uh, a bootleg I bought. Actually, I bought this at... It was at Megacon in Orlando, Florida. I think it was 2012. 2012 or 2010, I can't remember. 2012, it was in 2012. I was working in um, Treeport, Louisiana at Worldwide Effects at the time, and uh, I took time off to go to uh, Megacon, and I bought this. This was like the third figure I bought in my figure collection, and it was in a box, uh, so it was legitimately in a actual Good Smile Company box, uh, and it seemed real from from the outside, and I bought it. I kept it in the box for years until uh, one of my moves, the box got damaged and I figured to take it out. And that's when I was able to inspect it uh, a little closer. Right off the bat, the, uh, the stand, which I have tucked away somewhere. Um, a lot of times you can, you're able to tell a bootleg because the figure will not fit in the stand. It's like, if you're really struggling to put a figure, you know, through the holder and in the stand, that's a sure sign that this is a, a bootleg. Uh, they're really not the uh, actual figures are really not designed that way they're designed to be able to every all the parts fit uh with no issues um seamlessly very easily and this one right here another you know uh, i moved it a couple of times and, and you know the parts are very very flimsy uh very low quality um you know i was able to tell once i took it out of the box plastic it's really bad um you know, and then I went online to start making comparisons of this figure with the actual figure. You know, and you can tell from the paint job, um, the edges on a lot of the plastic is jaggedy. Uh, so, um, you know, a lot of times through the package, you're not able to tell uh, these things because, you know, you, you can't take them out unless you buy them. So, you know, there are certain signs the, that the plastic will look cheaper maybe a little too shiny uh so i would say if especially now in the era that everybody has a cell phone if you go to a convention and you're gonna buy a figure and you have any doubts whatsoever that it might be um a bootleg that it might be fake uh i would recommend don't buy it or go online to make a comparison of the actual figure from the actual vendor from the manufacturer so you can make comparisons and see any discrepancies between the two. And even then, if you have any doubt, just walk away, go to another vendor. Uh, there's a lot of reputable vendors at conventions that will stand by their product and they, they sell absolutely legitimate products. So it, it's, it's a hit and miss at a lot of conventions. I've been to conventions where people just straight out like, you know, I like recording video of conventions and making compilations and posting them on YouTube. And, you know, if the vendor has any reservation, any issue with you, even in passing recording their booth, my suggestion steer clear because chances are those are unlicensed products. Those are, those are counterfeit products. Uh, just go to another vendor and get it from them uh, because you know this money it's your money and you should be able to get quality products for what you pay for so that's it for uh counterfeit figures uh another thing uh and you guys you guys might be able to see this in the next couple of weeks by the time i make the next post um this is going to be my next uh, pastime project here. So what I'm going to do at some point later today, I'm going to open this up and start putting it together. Uh, Friends is one of those shows that uh, I couldn't watch when it first aired because it started airing when I was in the army. So I, I was not able to watch it like you watch episodes now. It's so easy now with streaming that you can pick a show and start from episode one and work your way up to the current episode or the last episode of the show already ended. Um, back in those days, you needed a VCR and being in the army, we train a lot in the field. So a VCR wasn't able to hold uh, a month full of all the, uh, all the shows I wanted to watch that I, I was missing. So Friends was one of those shows that I liked, but I would 
I, I never really followed it through because I would watch one episode one month and another episode two months later, um, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, so, you know, uh, I always wanted to, back in the day, buy the VHSs and watch the show. Well, that never happened. And then the DVDs came out and they were expensive. So I didn't, I didn't buy them. So that didn't happen. And then now uh, that streaming is available, I'm able to watch it. But yeah, I'm going to be putting this together, hopefully make room for it on the back. So hopefully in a couple of weeks when I post the next video, this will be displayed in the back somewhere. So this is I can get into the nitty gritty of today's episode, which is coffee. It's not, it's not really coffee. I'm not talking about coffee today. I'm talking about the Atari 800. For those of you, a lot of you are familiar with the Atari, but because of the 2600. I, I think uh, pretty much the entire world is familiar with the Atari 2600. And this is the one I found on, uh, on Let Go, along with the uh, 130EX. And I had, I had totally forgotten that I had an Atari mouse. I was going through uh, some of my uh, uh, audio video uh, wires for, for another console. And I ran into this and I was like, I totally forgot I had this. So that's pretty cool. Unfortunately, I don't have any piece of software for either the Atari 800 or the 130EX that I would be able to use this with, but I'm going to look for it uh, to see if there there were any user interface, uh, graphical user interface programs uh, for the uh, 130 and see if uh, I'm able to use this with it. Now, this is compatible with the Commodore 64, for, so for those of you who had Geos, uh, this would work on it. It's got two buttons, so that's the nice thing about it. Uh, but yeah, I want to find something that I can use it for the Atari 130EX. So I'll just set this aside here. Now, what I'm going to, going to be talking about, this is from back in the day when I was eight years old. Um, we got our first computer in the house, and it was my, bro my brother's. Uh, he got a Commodore 64, and it had a tape uh, deck. And for those of you who don't know, back in the day, uh, you were able to save computer programs on a cassette tape. And <laughs> that, that's how my brother uh, was first saving his programs. Now, me being the, the brat that I was, uh, I, of course, I, I couldn't leave his computer alone. So whenever he was at home, I was sneaking to his room and play with the computer. Uh, first language that I learned to play with was uh, uh, BASIC, which came preloaded on the Commodore 64. Now, uh, when I was a kid, I wanted to grow up and be a fighter pilot. I wanted to join the Air Force and and pilot uh, an F-15. That was my that was my dream uh, fighter, the F-15. What I wanted to to fly and, and do. And uh, right around the uh, the crash of the uh, uh, of the Atari game crash, uh, basically Atari ended up taking pretty much the entire gaming industry along with it. And we used to shop at Sears in Chula Vista. And after the uh, the video game market collapsed, uh, I remember going there, and the computer and video game section were section were kind of um, they kind of merged, and they were a mess. You walk in there, and, and video games would be open, ripped out of their box, just laying on the floor. I remember going over by by the computer section and seeing they had uh, F15 Strike. Eagle for the Commodore 64. And I remember it was in clearance. Everything was in clearance. It was just trying to get rid of video games at the time. Uh, I remember um, Sears, shortly after that, really focused their, their attention away from video games straight to computers. Uh, so they had, you know, they had, um, back then, I can't even remember the NECs. They had uh, different brands, but this is when they were trying to build up that, but they were trying to get rid of the video game part of it. So all the video games were, were shoved over close to the, uh, the, the console video games. 
So I remember seeing a 15 strike Eagle and they had the, the, the instructions book, the manual, uh, but I couldn't find the game. It was, you know, everything was out of the box, just thrown all over the place. And I remember I had to dig through so many floppy disks until I found the Deso and with it. Again, being a clearance, I was able to get it like, I think back then it was like 750, something like that. I remember I had $10 in my pocket. I was able to buy it and still have some change left. And I was so excited to, to be able to play this when I, I got home. The thing is, I never quite got the hang of it. <laughs> it was kind of weird. Um, but um, that was the, the first computer game that I ever bought. And I held on to that game. I don't know if, if I still have it back home in, in the garage somewhere. It might. Uh, but recently, I saw it on eBay. So this is uh, the very same game, the uh, F-15 Strike Eagle, but for the Atari 800. And I want to open this up here. Now this is sturdy and I like that they wrote do not bend on here. So this game was released by Microprose. Right there. I remember that. Microprose. And they came out, this has a release date of June 15, 1985. Pretty sure I bought this game just a couple of years after that. 87. Re requires 48K of RAM, which luckily this has. One or two joysticks. So I, I guess you can do a two player mode on this. Uh, disc, place the program disc in your disk drive and turn on your computer. Here's the game. Unfortunately, it doesn't have the, uh, you can tell this is where the label was. I hope this is an original and not a, uh, a backup copy. Considering that it's in a data soft uh, sleeve here instead of the microprose. So, put the disc in here. Fingers crossed that it works. Turn it off. So it's reading, it's doing this thing. Hopefully this is the, uh, the Atari 800 version. There it is, F-15 Strike Eagle. Wow, that loaded fairly fast. I was really expecting it to go further. I remember with the Commodore 64, it took a lot longer than that. That I do remember. I used to get, get very, like, come on, hurry up. So here you can see uh, copy written, this was copy written in 1984, but it wasn't released until 1985. So I don't know what the hold up to get it out and working. Maybe maybe that's when they were still working on it and they, kind of, they were getting close to releasing it and they had copyrighted. There we go. Oh, you can also just press the number of the machine you want to do. So there, and then start to, start. This is kind of like their anti-piracy thing. So that way, if you make a copy of it from your friend, but your friend has the, the guide, um, they're not able to uh, get past the authentication. The Commodore 64 didn't have this. And each console, basically each computer system, has its own authentication letter. There we go. Look at that. And sharing the anime. And there it goes. That's pretty cool. So you got the guns there, and I guess if you want to switch to missiles, press M. Missile arm, you want to do a bomb, you press B. If you want to go back to guns, you press G. That's pretty cool. 
So I'm about to hit land, and the uh, right now is blue, and now is green because you're over land. So I remember, I remember from playing this. Now as a kid, it's like obviously I, I, I didn't know much about ah alert air missile flares F. I just let it fly by itself. So I'm really surprised how well this actually plays on this. I don't remember it playing this smoothly on the Commodore 64. But then again, I had a feeling that some, that the, the disc I have was damaged. Uh, that could have explained why it. I remember it taking longer to load on the Commodore 64. Uh, for those of you who've never seen a floppy disk like this, this is a five and a quarter inch floppy. And these were the thing back in the 80s uh, before the uh, three and a half inch uh, ones came out. A lot of people confuse these and they call them hard disks. They're not hard disks, they're floppy disks. Um, basically, the what you call a disk has to do with what's inside. And if you can see right there, that's the disk inside and that's a floppy disk, not a hard disk. A hard disk uh, came out for hard drives and uh, that's why they're called hard drives. It's a hard metal disk uh, that you can uh, magnetically write information to. Uh, but these were um, three and a quarter, three and a half inch. Um, yeah, three and a half inch floppies compared to a five and a quarter inch floppy. Uh, they held more information, uh, not a whole lot. The first ones that came out only held, held like 256K more than the five and a, and a quarter inch uh, drives. So here's a size comparison between the two. All right, guys, so I'm going to start wrapping things up here. I'm actually going to talk a little bit about what I'm going to talk about on the next installment. And on the next installment, I want to talk about mini discs. Those of you who don't know what a mini disc looks like, this is what a mini disc is. If you're a Matrix fan, you actually might have seen Neo bootlegging video games to one of these. Now, here in the States, they were very limited release, but in Japan, they actually sold uh, drives, computer drives, uh, for mini discs, and you can actually write data, not just music, but you could use these as computer storage. So that's all the time for this installment. Just wanted to touch very briefly on this and a little bit of the announcements I gave out at the beginning. Uh, I hope you guys uh, stay safe out there with everything happening. Uh, you know, don't don't go out unless absolutely necessary. But um, you find a good deal, uh, definitely go go get it. So guys, thanks thanks for watching. Please uh, take care, be kind, rewind.